Okay, welcome back to VMworld 2013. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm excited for the two guests here. We have uh, Josh McKinty, co-founder and CTO of Piston Cloud, and Joe Arnold, CEO of SwiftStack. And uh, we've been uh, discussing uh, uh, OpenStack for quite some time, and uh, obviously, you know, we've been following it since its foundation, and prior with Rackspace. And then this past year, we had three days of live coverage with theCUBE at mm -hmm. OpenStack Summit, where we went up there, it was a full documented, all developers, all signal, no noise, kick ass, momentum, and of course we've been covering the space, but then we had the AWS debate, you guys, <laughs> where Joe hosted, and you were on a plane, and we had a crowd chat, Randy Bias doing his thing. We missed you, Mark, yeah. we missed you. I'm uh, sorry. So yeah. OpenStack is hot, you have Martin Casada obviously on the religion, drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, VMware saying, hey, we love OpenStack, it's a market expansion opportunity, it's kind of out there. Um, so guys, let's, let's, let's talk about OpenStack in context to VMware. Um, big buzz in OpenStack, Martin essentially laid it out. It resonates with people why they want it more mm -hmm. than what's actually happening, which is still impressive. OpenStack resonates with enterprises mm -hmm. um, and the communities behind it. So, so that's positive. So how does that translate into VMware show here, VMworld? This is a great question. You know, I think Pat put this really well yesterday when he was talking about legacy workloads and next-gen workloads. And uh, you know, the comparisons to mainframes are perhaps harsh but, but fair. Uh, VMware and Microsoft compete for the mainframe workloads in today's data centers. You know, the equivalent of the mainframe, which is traditional client-server applications. And the which perception, is now cloud, which is now cloud, right? The, the perception these <laughs> days is that uh, every market is going to be a two-horse race, and the two-horse race for next-gen cloud applications is between OpenStack and Amazon. VMware is not going to be a third horse. They have to be part of the OpenStack team, and I think that's the transition we've seen them on in the last year. And I think they voted with that, and you're seeing the, the, the positioning um, and posture is very positive right mm -hmm. now. People are, are smiling and palm yeah. pressing, yeah. you know, getting behind each other. But some are speculating that that might shake out as people see the, the land grab opportunity possibly. Well, look, the way, what we're seeing is people are just using the best tool for the job. Mm -hmm. and you're certainly seeing your deployments yeah. co-mingling with VR de de deployments. We're seeing exactly the same thing. So I, what, we're do is, what we do at SwissStack is more focused on the storage angle, and that can co-mingle with all sorts of different environments. And as the infrastructure that is getting built out gets bigger and bigger, they're not applying multi-tools or general purpose things anymore. They're finding the right tool for the job uh, in the data center. I think what you guys are doing is awesome and I think one of the validations I'll share with you, we were at an HP event last month, um, HP Big Data event held their top customers all, and they were big names, they weren't, they weren't slackers and they weren't uh, just there as plants, they were like big name companies, you know, uh, Facebook and a bunch of others, Twitter, you name it, all the big companies, Zynga, you name it. And the feedback from uh, George Kadifa, who runs HP mm -hmm. Software was, I asked him, what is the most exciting thing that get, gets you jazzed up? That's a, you know, pick your mm -hmm. pick your answer, you know, tee it up. He said OpenStack. Of all the choices he's OpenStack, I said why? Because OpenStack, it's not about the free software, it's about the freedom, right? right? So that's to me really speaks volumes. And it's interesting, people want agility and service catalogs, but they need a foundation. So I want to ask you guys the question: what foundation elements need to be in place? And you see vCloud kind of telegraphing their position with disaster recovery. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, I don't think anyone's standing up saying, I'll volunteer and do the disaster recovery for OpenStack, or do, are they? Is it, are they going to go after the easy foundational things? And what does a foundation look like for, for, for the proprietary vendors? I mean, this is, this is a, an interesting question for both of us because mm -hmm. I think SwiftStack and Piston have both focused on curated fundamentals, which are those foundation pieces. You know, we do, we do HA, we do uh, an update service. We do these really boring and very necessary pieces. We do security. Boring um, and table stakes for the enterprise. Table stakes, absolutely. You need, uh, what's, what's fun about the, this, this collection of fundamentals is we have joint customers now with basically every ecosystem player. You know, so we, mm -hmm. have, we have customers with Nasira, uh, which I, I think you saw our logo during the keynote. We also have customers with other network vendors um, and, and ditto on the storage side. And so that really is that freedom that folks are, are looking for is to be able to mix and match 
a set of vendors in their data center. The software defined data center label is a really powerful concept because we're taking the, the silos down around storage and compute and networking, but we're not limiting the scope of the vendors and saying, okay, well, because it's all one set of APIs, that doesn't mean you have to buy from one individual. Joe, you, Joe, talk about this from your perspective because you mentioned tools for the job. Martin talks about an erector set. And you know, we all as kids play with erector sets, we're dating ourselves. I don't know if they're still around, but the, uh, that's kind of the mindset. Hey, build your own, but here's some base frameworks and yeah. or solutions. It's all about, it's all about the private cloud. And you know, our boring features, LDAP integration, you know, package-based installer. I mean, we, we're, we're collectively, I think, trying to make it so that really any operator can get up and running with this infrastructure. Um, and, and, and so, I don't know. The, the this kind of changes the software. So Dave and I were, mm -hmm. this is the first time we're talking about it on theCUBE, but I'll throw it out there because it's, it's a half-baked kind of thesis, but mm -hmm. we were speculating open source is obviously the future. It's ratifying things in the community. That's the new standards body, we said that. But the old model of downloading Linux the new generation of guys love Amazon because the, the stack's all being updated for them, right? So that kind of brings back the appliance. So if it's a tool for the job, do the customers care that there's another appliance that kicks ass on, say, LDAP well, integrations? No, well, right? Well, it's all about it's about building out private cloud infrastructure. And what does that private cloud infrastructure look like? And in order to get a footprint into the private enterprise, you need to have those integrations, like with LDAP and Active Directory and ease of deployment and management and operations. And what we're seeing from a storage perspective is that people are bringing their storage workloads in house, and that coexists with a core of compute infrastructure, which actually exists with many different vendors. And then from a bursting perspective to go out into the public cloud, yeah, you can do that. It's, it's like this analogy between water and electricity that we have. It's, it's, it's data <laughs> is like building those dams did and aqueducts. Did you guys see Pat Gelsinger's interview on theCUBE this morning? No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, Same so, analogy? Same. No, 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 but we'll, we'll, you should watch that interview. But okay. I want to ask you the definition of private cloud because obviously VMware's betting on hybrid cloud, mm. which I'm a big fan of, don't get me wrong. Um, I did kind of make a reference to it, calling it a halfway house and Pat kind of, you know, punch me in the gut a few times on that, but I mean, I meant it in a very you know way of it's a destination stop, it's a way way station, something. Well, that was my perspective. Pat Pat disagrees. He's betting all in on hybrid. Sure, look at look it, at the water the analogy. Well, the what's the definition? Is it different? What is private cloud infrastructure? Is it? Look look at the water analogy because everyone has a hot water tank in their house, right? And the reason is, yeah, you don't want your own well necessarily. That's not efficient. You can rely on other people to get the water out of the ground. But keeping the water hot, that's something best done local. That really is the definition of what will be the long-term private cloud solution. Private data belongs in private places, typically in a building you control if you really care about it. And data locality does matter for performance. So if you're talking about big data, and this keeps coming up as a use case, big data really, uh, latency matters. Putting it in someone else's data center is probably not the best solution. We have customers that have had a, had a huge footprint in Amazon and it was incredibly expensive for them to deploy, maintain, and operate. And be, by able to shrink that down and doing private data center, they've been able to optimize that from a price and a performance perspective to be exactly what they needed. Yeah, we had George Sussman from io.com, which is a new hot company. Well, not, they've been around for a while. He's a self-funded startup, great guy. Um, and he said, hey, software-defined data center is great, but what about the data center piece of it? Software, obviously everyone's getting behind the software piece, which we love, but they still have that data center, the, the hot water tanks, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that is an interesting thing. That's power and cooling, mm -hmm. that's footprint, that's sensors on devices, that's moving workloads around. I mean, that's still who the action is. I mean, I, I don't want to move this conversation all the way out into the sort of converged infrastructure domain and talk about the ODMs and quanta and open compute, but that is this other wave that's, that's coming through the data center right now. And mm. I mean, I think you, if you look at IBM and HP and Dell and how they're positioning around OpenStack, they're driving up the stack as fast as they can. The same thing that, that VMware has been, has been doing, driving towards those management tools. And the reason is because the, the physical hardware is both converging, the storage and, and compute and networking hardware, and it's, it's losing its margins. Right, when you're competing directly with an ODM, we're happy with a 10% margin. If your business relies on 30 to 90% margin, that's going away really quick. Yeah. Right, we have, we have our, our biggest customers, when you said, hey, we'd like to work with your hardware vendor to make sure we're compatible. They said, which of the three? Yeah, and the same with storage and all compute, so all yeah. pieces of converged infrastructure. So OpenStack gives that freedom, right? So that's back to the freedom, not just free. There's nothing's ever free in, in life, as we know. But uh, open, open source is great, but let's talk about the freedom piece. What specific things do you guys point to right now that is the best about OpenStack and from a tech perspective under the hood that allows for freedom for construction of, of public cloud, private cloud, and, and hybrid clouds for our customers? 
I, go for it. All right, so I think at, at the core, right, all of us are building at the, at, at the foundation of what we do, the engines behind our product is based on open source. And that gives our customers and the whole ecosystem to participate, to contribute to it, to move it forward as a shared group. And uh, so I think that truly represents freedom because there is options. They're not going to get locked in. They don't want to get Microsoft again um, by being locked into a single platform. So having going with OpenStack gives them that choice. I, I would I would double down on that on that comment and say one of our biggest customer deployments right now has, uh, and in fact. So 80% of our large deployments are using Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack. And they're looking at this freedom from the pass layer as well as the infrastructure layer. They have two or three different SDN solutions. They have a couple of different hypervisors and they're saying, you know what? The dashboard that we're relying on, the orchestration tools and the pass layer is unified. We can rely on that and we're going we're gonna to experiment under the hood knowing that we can, we can double down on any one vendor later on. And we had two guys on earlier that I, I really like to talk to. One is uh, Sean Douglas, who was, mm -hmm. has a lot of experience at uh, EMC and CTO office and EMC Ventures. Yeah. So he spent some time walking the landscape and also involved in the Nasir deal and Martin. Right, so we always talk about the hypervisor. Now you got Sean is loving life right now at Service Mesh, and Martin's obviously executing out on the on the billion dollar bet that VMware is making. But they all talk about the virtualization around the hypervisor. So what is the current state of the hypervisor debate right now in terms of how it should deal with multiple hypervisors and storage and other elements? I love to keep this in real time. So there's an email thread this morning on the OpenStack mailing list proposing to add support for Docker to OpenStack. Docker, for those who aren't familiar, is this new sort of container-based pass. People are starting to say, you know, what's really the difference between a VM or a container or bare metal provisioning as far as the user is concerned? Remember, this entire cloud movement is being driven by DevOps. The developers don't care. What they want is some logical container for their application components, and that might be a process, it might be a container, it might be a VM, it might be a full machine. So OpenStack more and more is allowing folks to deal with all of those resources in exactly the same way. That's it's super exciting. Yeah, and it scrunches down the importance of what that hypervisor is, and the importance is in the applications and the services that those applications can consume, whether that's compute resources or, or database resources so or storage resources. So diversity of containers is a better approach than trying to make someone eat, bite off more than they can chew. Look, we, can we can abstract everything below wherever that, what that, what that containerization looks like, what that platform looks like. So down here we can swap things out, we can try new things, and we can get the best tool for whatever application that we're trying to build. And so what does this do, these kinds of debates? I mean, one thing that scares me about standards bodies or, or communities is that you have you know, basically gridlock from you know, people trying to stall the process of innovation by throwing more, more arguments onto the fire. Uh, OpenStack has done pretty well on the governance side. Are you starting, is it still solid? Are you guys happy with that? Do you see more mm, haymakers coming in? I, I mean, am, I am more know? and more happy with it because... <laughs> Proof is in the pudding, yeah. you know? We've got, we've got customers who are happy with it, right? We yeah. continue to deploy this every week. We're like standing up another large environment and, yeah. and that, that to me is, is the final proof point to say we, we're not a standards body, we've never been a standards body, and we've been very careful about not accidentally turning into a standards body. What we have is rough consensus and working code. You know, yeah. it's interesting, we love doing the cube because we get to hear from everyone, especially the smart guys like you guys, but last mm -hmm. night we were talking to the VCs who are, they have a lot, they have big checks, they write checks, mm -hmm. and you know, all the parties were last night, so the conversation was like, okay, well what's the future of compute? the containers, and they're trying, to make, they're trying to bet on a market. It's a moving train at this point, so it's really hard. So, um, what are you seeing on the startup scene? Because you guys are out building companies, so what is, uh, what's your take on the startup scene? Are the bets already made? Uh, are there new bets? I mean, do you see Go ahead. the young guns coming in? The DevOps culture is now a mindset. It's now the Kool-Aid everyone's drinking. Look, I mean, we're, you know? I think Jonathan I think, uh, and Tyler are looking at each other because we're, we're just in there trying to duke it out, trying to solve customer problems. And yeah, I, I, our, our, our respective boards are probably outsourcing and, and, and looking at deals, but that's not something that uh, I guess we're, we're, we're plugged in at. We're actually on customer sites doing deployments, getting infrastructure stood up, uh, and just doing the best thing we can there. The beautiful yeah. thing is the market is so wide open right now, and there's no lock-in anymore. It's like Dave and I were talking about like the car analogy. We're like, yeah, it's kind of like you know, horse and carriage is gone, but now you got cars, but there's so many different car types you can make. You can make sports cars, you can make vans, whatever you want, you mm -hmm. could build the engine of virtualization and converged infrastructure with software. It's interesting, because now it's like, everyone's talking about the engine here, right? You know, yeah. Not necessarily the dials and AC or power windows, and that's big data. That could be the applications, right? So again, this comes back down to 
the, the fan base, right? So with that analogy, is the engine almost ready? What's the engine look like? You guys are, I always consider, you know, in, the, in, the, in, that, in that department. What is the engine? The, the engine is more than ready. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the cars have been rolling off the lot for a year, right? <laughs> so the, the race <laughs> now, the race now is is uh, is to make sure that that they handle well and that yeah. folks aren't driving over the speed limit. So if yeah. you think about, okay, what were the first Model Ts like? Uh, no seat belts. You know. So yeah, they're ready. People are driving them now. We spend a lot Health of time focused on. as a starter. <laughs> Scott's got well, to no, turn I mean, over. training. Yeah. Just yeah. making sure. It's about the apps. It's like that economy thing. It's about the apps, stupid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what people are doing this for. Follow the so apps. We said yeah. follow the apps, follow the money. That's the kind of the, the paradigm. Absolutely. Okay, we got a break, guys. Joe, and appreciate it. Josh, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Uh, we'll be following you. We're not going to go to the OpenStack Summit uh, in Hong Kong. <sighs> a little bit of a long haul for theCUBE. Uh, yeah. Unless someone ponies up some, some underwriting, maybe we'll consider it. But we'd love to go there. We'll certainly be at the next, next one in Portland. Congratulations. Great to have you on the chat with uh, Randy recently. So good luck and congratulations. This is theCUBE at VMworld. These are the guys making it happen, solving customer problems, and that's the proof in the pudding. Mm -hmm. Voting with code. Solving customer problems is the startup opportunity uh, for all you entrepreneurs out there. We'll be right back after this short break. Thanks, John.